Hi, everyone. We'll wait just a 10 to 20 seconds or so as people settle into their Zoom boxes here, and uh, and then we'll get going. You are at the Silver, Silver Hill Hospital Grand Rounds program. All right, hello and welcome everybody. I am Dr. Jeff Katzman, the Director of Education here at Silver Hill Hospital. And we are absolutely delighted to have you join us where we are privileged to welcome Dr. Christina Sauer, who will be presenting on the topic of disordered eating. And I will have the pleasure of introducing her in just a moment. First, some housekeeping for all of us. Our next round rounds is on November 9th and we'll welcome Dr. Terrence Keene, from the VA system who will be uh, speaking on the remarkable past, present, and future of the study of psychological trauma. You can sign up for that event and all our remaining grand rounds for 2022 on our hospital website calendar under education and resources. For today's lecture, if you wish to receive education credits, CME or CEU, please kindly complete the evaluation survey that'll pop up in the browser when the webinar ends. And we'll also email a copy of the evaluation after the webinar concludes. As always, I will moderate a Q&A discussion with Dr. Sauer at the end of her lecture. Um, and we should have around 20 minutes or so for that. Questions remain such an important part of our Grand Rounds program. So please use this opportunity to uh, put forward questions and comments to Dr. Sauer. You can submit a question anytime using the Q&A box, either with your name, or if you prefer, you can submit it anonymously. And finally, disclosures, no planners of this activity have indicated a relevant financial relationship with an ACCME defined ineligible company whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used by or on patients. It is now my great pleasure and honor, really, to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Christina Sauer. Dr. Sauer is a board-certified general child and adolescent psychiatrist and associate professor at the University of New Mexico. Dr. Sauer was born and raised in Colorado and completed medical school at the University of Colorado. She completed an internship in family medicine at Santa Rosa Family Medicine Residency and residency and fellowship at the University of New Mexico. And I still remember many conversations uh, I had with Dr. Sauer who was when she was considering the program at UNM. And I would say to her, yes, uh, please come to New Mexico. And thankfully she did. Uh, she, as I mentioned, is an associate professor and the program director for the general psychiatry residency and also Director for Wellness Initiatives for Graduate Medical Education at UNM uh, Office of Professional Wellbeing. Her primary clinical and educational focus is in the realm of eating disorders, considering especially diversity and equity in care needs. There are really no inpatient eating disorders, I, I don't think, in the entire state of New Mexico, and Dr. Sauer is often consulted really as the state expert. She works with trainees, including general psychiatry residents, child fellows, and psychologists, helping them to gain a better understanding of eating disorders. And she is a certified um, as an eating disorder specialist by the International Society of Eating Disorders. She is also among the only providers providing ECT to children in the state of New Mexico. And she also provides somehow clinical coverage at the inpatient uh, units at the University of New Mexico. She has received multiple uh, teaching awards um, and uh, which have continued, she's continued to receive over the past few years. I, I wanna say on a personal note, um, I wanna tell you a little bit about Dr. Sauer. I've known Christina since she was a resident and then a child psychiatry fellow uh, when I was in charge of education at the University of New Mexico. She's always been extremely humble about her accomplishments though I can brag a bit as I'm in the position to know all about her. She has become the training director of the general residency program at UNM for the past year. And over this time, I've watched as she continues to transform the program. She's created Harry Potter-like houses among trainees, mentorship blocks of protected time, academic interest groups, 
all to help trainees feel more connected to the program and to combat a sense of isolation that we all inevitably experience and that interferes with learning. She's managing a program of 60 trainees, working with a large faculty, and at the same time is in charge of all wellness activities for trainees in all residency programs across the School of Medicine. She remains calm and centered all the time, continually able to think from multiple perspectives to a point that really is quite moving. I've learned each day that I work with Dr. Sauer, um, what I continue to watch is her steadfast devotion to thinking about the well-being of trainees. Of course, a training director is a very difficult job, solving problems all the time and rarely with a moment to receive recognition. So thanks uh, everyone for allowing me to indulge in um, and really recognize uh, Dr. Sauer's, Sauer's talent and contributions. And may we all get to work with people like Christina. I now, we get to learn about disordered eating from Dr. Sauer. Thanks Christina in advance for finding time to teach us all about this really important topic. We've received many requests and evaluations to learn more about this. Many, many registrations for this event. So I'm grateful for your green to educate us today. Um, so thank you. And I will pass the baton to you and sign off here, uh, but be right here and come back for the Q&A session. Sounds great. Thank you so much for the really generous introduction and kind words. Certainly I have found our um, your mentorship and my capacity to learn from and work with you invaluable and really grateful for this opportunity here at Silver Hill. So thank you. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you for making time to join this session today. And I really hope it's a valuable learning opportunity. And again, as mentioned earlier, um, we'll have some space for questions and answers at the end. Um, so Dr. Katzman provided an introduction to who I am. We'll go ahead and launch into the content. Um, I do not have any relevant financial disclosures. As mentioned, I work at the University of New Mexico and then also have a small hat working with our eating disorder treatment center here in town as well. Okay, so the objectives for our talk, it's a pretty broad session in terms of content. Um, so I'm hoping to give a good holistic overview. And then of course, there's a lot of room to you know, go deeper with questions and follow up So we'll talk about the prevalence and impacts of disordered eating and distinguish the difference between disordered eating and then what is really an eating disorder. Um, some of that's based off the DSM-5, but we'll spend some time thinking about that and what the formal criteria for eating disorders are. And then we will talk about some of the warning signs, behaviors, like kind of red flags that we might think about when we're working with people in terms of eating patterns and relationship with their bodies. <clears throat> and then we'll talk some about treatment options and assessment intervention strategies that you know hopefully clinically are very relevant and you know, I think often we may have people in our lives who are struggling with disordered eating. And so just thinking about approaching people also who we aren't necessarily clinically um, in relationship with. Okay, so this picture and slide I like to start with in terms of the fact that, um, you know, eating disorders are quite prevalent and really can affect people of all ages, genders, backgrounds, sizes, um, you know, I think sometimes there's been more historical stigma and we might visually associate a certain appearance with an eating disorder, but again, to honor that it certainly can affect people across the spectrum of human experience. Um, this slide I screenshot from um, a bit ago, some of the news stories that were really highly published during the pandemic, especially the height of the pandemic, about the increasing number of people that we were seeing with more severe eating disorders. There was a pretty substantial increase in adolescents who were hospitalized nationally for severe eating disorders, but also just in general, um, people of all ages that were struggling more in terms of food and uh, you know, kind of their eating patterns, which may have been very likely some stress response, especially with a lot of things out of our control during the pandemic. Um, and thus far, although, you know, the pandemic has shifted, a lot of these higher numbers as compared to pre-pandemic have really continued in terms of the number of people struggling with eating disorders. 
And then also to highlight that many people during their, whether it's medical training. So the slide I was thinking about, you know, people that come through medical school, but I think simultaneously, if people are coming through, um, you know, receiving their social work degree, psychology, um, other types of, you know, healthcare, behavioral health work, that often there's pretty limited educational content on eating disorders. Um, and the experiential opportunity while we're training to work with people with eating disorders can be highly variable, right? So some people may train at centers that there's a formal eating disorder unit um, or clinic, but for those that don't, it can be kind of hit or miss or sparse opportunity. So there was a paper that was published a few years ago that was a survey of program directors of residencies, of primary care and psychiatric residencies nationally. And I think there were um, in the hundreds of responses. And so the, the question was, you know, how much time do your trainees receive learning about eating disorders in terms of didactics and then also clinical or experiential time? So most people um, receive between zero to four hours of didactics during their entire residency training. And psychiatry residents tend to receive the most, um, but again, it's pretty limited. And then as mentioned, the clinical experience can vary. So where I think this is important and real is realizing that, um, you know, this eating disorders and disordered eating affect millions of people. Many of us don't have a lot of formal training and many of the colleagues we work with also may not. So just in terms of anchoring what we'll go over today and also the education we can share with other people. So my goals for you all are to be able to reflect some on your experiences to date working with people with disordered eating, um, share any questions or feedback that you may have along the way, and then hopefully you know, think some about how you can integrate various topics that we talk about today into your practice too. So I just wanted to share a few kind of sample um, patient encounters that I've had in terms of the diversity and breadth that we see in, in working with people with disordered eating. Um, so for example, a seven-year-old black male with autism spectrum disorder who has been labeled as a picky eater, um, but continues to struggle as he's getting a little older with eating adequately, losing weight, he's been falling off the growth curve. And so family presented pretty worried about um, his trajectory from a, a physical stance and, and the struggles with getting him to eat. Um, and then an 18 year old Native American individual who identifies as gender fluid was um, diagnosed male at birth and is also a track athlete, but has noted or um, has been observed to have a lot, of, a lot of anxiety about their weight and some substantial change in eating habits. A 46 year old Hispanic male with a history of substantial childhood trauma and depression who is being seen for the depression, but has had continued weight gain and does endorse frequent binging in the evenings. Um, and then a 26 year old white female who's in her first pregnancy and at 28 weeks, who's failing to gain weight as anticipated, a lot of anxiety. And so maybe just some red flags about what might be happening. Okay, so we'll go ahead and jump in to some poll questions. Jane, if you could help me with these, we'll launch the first set here. Thank you. So the first question being what percentage of the people in the United States will meet criteria for an eating disorder during their lifetime? And then <clears throat> we would consider all of the following to be risk factors for the development of an eating disorder, except which of the following? Thank you. Okay. So for the first question, the most, the majority of people voted 10% of people in the US will meet criteria for an eating disorder, which is correct. Yes, good job on that. Um, and then the second one being, intellectual disability being the one factor listed here that's not considered a risk factor for development of an eating disorder. So that is also indeed the case. Um, all right, thank you, Jane. Okay, so let's spend a little bit of time talking about statistics and epidemiology of disordered eating. So the prevalence of formal eating disorders globally 
from some of the more recent data is about one to 2% of, of people throughout the world will have an eating disorder at some point in their lifetime and higher here in the United States as in many um, industrialized nations. So about 10% will develop one in their lifetime. Um, we know that a large percentage of adolescents and especially we think of adolescent females, although I think we're also just gaining more um, insight into the fact that it's not just females, of course, but um, maybe a quarter to half will struggle with body image dissatisfaction and some degree of disordered eating during their adolescent time. Um, and when we think about the impact that eating disorders can have on an individual, it can be pretty, um, pretty broad again. So certainly there's the impact on one's psychological functioning, both the changes that um, inadequate nutrition or just um, different nutrition can have on the brain and the way that we're able to think and function, but also, you know, kind of psychologically how people see themselves, um, how that can exacerbate or, or be intertwined with anxiety and mood symptoms, and then physical well being, of course, the sequelae there. Um, we know there can be a lot of impact on psychosocial functioning, on relationships, on development in terms of school or. Um, work and, and other career pursuits. And then the family unit, which sometimes um, holds the roots to the drivers of an eating disorder, but also can definitely be impacted by someone who's struggling. And again, just identity development. So I think a lot of times when we see adolescents who are struggling with eating disorders, there can be a bit of an experience where they almost kind of like sort of stall in terms of development or that they may have um, you know, the, the trajectory of their kind of individuation and launching out um, from their families of origin may seem different in terms of the fact that they're also pretty fixated on the eating disorder. And this really highlights the value of early intervention. So many studies have shown that the earlier you can intervene for someone who's struggling with disordered eating, the better the outcome in terms of less likely that people will progress into sort of a refractory or kind of relapsing remitting situation. And this is likely a mix of both the sensitivity to the nutritional, the impact of nutrition on our brain, but also as we think about coping mechanisms and other ways for people to, to deal with difficult feelings um, and shifting that away from food and body as early as possible um, in terms of being preventative. So this slide captures much of what I've said, just again, that um, it can affect people of all ages, um, racial and ethnic backgrounds, gender, sexual orientation, and eating disorders actually have um, now secondary to deaths from opioid overdose or opioid use disorder, which is number one. Eating disorders, primarily anorexia nervosa, actually has the second highest um, mortality rate of any mental health condition. So sometimes we think about you know, schizophrenia or bipolar and tend to associate those with higher mortality, but anorexia um, comes, comes above those. Okay, um, so just a few more statistics. This is thinking about for young people of anorexia in those teenage kind of early adult years, their mortality, their risk of mortality is much higher than peers without eating disorders. Um, and we are really not, you know, fully or formally diagnosing and treating many people with eating disorders. It's probably less than 50% of individuals that we actually catch. Um, and then in terms of statistics of like how many people nationally are suffering with some of the most common eating disorders, it's reflected here. So about one to 2% of people um, in the US will uh, are suffering with anorexia, two to 4% with bulimia, and then around 5% with binge eating disorder, but this is a newer diagnosis. And, and I think we're continuing to observe that there are probably more people with binge eating disorder than have been kind of um, assessed previously. Okay, so there was the poll question about risk factors. These are just some of the risk factors um, that I've narrowed here for disordered eating. So one is gender. Transgender individuals are actually at a very high risk of disordered eating, especially male to female transgender, um, but tr as maybe traditionally has been believed to also females um, to some extent more so than males. 
people who identify as LGBTQAI or non-heterosexual are at higher risk, as well as people of racial and ethnic minority backgrounds, which, you know, a lot of times I think historically people have associated, you know, kind of white higher socioeconomic class individuals to be more likely to develop eating disorders, but that's actually not the case. Um, people who are in the spotlight, people where, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on their body or their performance, definitely, um, as well as having a family history of an eating disorder. Um, trauma history can often be sort of the predisposing risk to the, the trigger of an eating disorder. And then as mentioned in one of those cases, pregnancy and postpartum are definitely risk factors, especially for individuals who have had a history of an eating disorder. But it's unfortunately a time that we may often miss exacerbations, right? Because there's a lot of focus on, on baby and new transitions and sometimes not actually on how mom's doing in terms of her eating and coping. And then uh, we talk about a fair amount here in New Mexico where many people may have grown up in situations with um, in poverty or food insecurity, but definitely a history of food insecurity as a child can also be a risk factor. And then I just wanted to share a couple studies here that came out last year. So again, just thinking about stigma and kind of dispelling maybe some of the myths that have been associated with eating disorders. So on the left indicating that, you know, sometimes people will um, assume that for males or men struggling with eating disorders, it's not as common that it affects heterosexual males, but actually the majority of males with eating disorders are. And then um, again, you know, we talked about historically maybe white individuals having been thought to more likely experience eating disorders. But again, the statistics are not as such. The really, um, I think, concerning part that we're shifting more attention to is the fact that people of color traditionally have not been assessed the same way. And so often eating disorders have been missed. Um, and this study was looking at, you know, case studies where this was um, clinicians. So I think it was primarily therapists were presented with equal kind of case presentations of disordered eating in women of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. And so um, having identified an eating disorder in a white individual or, or Hispanic female was, um, this was done much more frequently than same symptoms in a black woman. And so again, really thinking about just like, okay, how do we, how do we really continue to keep our eyes open and just develop more, you know, consistent awareness um, and attention to disordered eating in a more diverse range of individuals. Okay. So eating disorders like other kind of coping strategies that people will develop are often related to um, challenges with emotional regulation, with like lack of control in other areas of life, um, sometimes around low self-esteem and an attempt to try to find a solution for that. And again, many people with eating disorders have a history of trauma, whether it's childhood trauma or kind of a traumatic event that can be a trigger. And so there is a mix definitely of genetics plus environment. Many people with eating disorders do have a genetic vulnerability, um, but then there's the environmental triggers that happen. And this graphic here is a pie chart showing some of the many influences um, on developing disordered eating. So we often think about, kind of as mentioned, you know, for folks that have a genetic predisposition, you tend to see eating disorders more in like folks who internalize more anxiety disorders, you know, not as common in, in people that have other externalizing challenges. Um, but also, you know, sometimes the trauma history and things like um, borderline personality disorder, there can just be some kind of comorbidities that we see more often. Um, there's often a, primarily, a primary trigger. So this might be a big change, a traumatic event, or someone who is trying to go on a diet because they're wanting to get healthier or stronger, but like that transition in their body and brain of getting into a more restrictive pattern of eating can really turn into a spiral. And then we recognize there are a lot of social influences. Whoops, I'm sorry. Um, so this graphic is highlighting some statistics about young people in our country and really how many children have a strong attachment to body image at, you know, at young ages, negative body image, um, kind of bullying and peer influences around weight and 
and then behaviors in terms of, you know, how many children report that they want to change their body, that they're not happy with it, that they want to lose weight, that they're trying to diet. And again, the, the numbers here are many kids who are in elementary school or middle school. And so I think we see, you know, both societally in terms of what parents kind of, um, you know, transmit to their children or pass along to their children in terms of dissatisfaction with body or focus on that, but also um, socially peer wise and then social media as uh, noted here. So there have been, you know, I think with the pandemic and awareness about how much time people have spent on social media um, over those couple of years, but just in general, the strong influence that social media has on all of us, there's so much kind of both subtle and direct messaging about how we should look, what's really attractive. Um, and then as mentioned here, messages where it's like, this is kind of the way to be losing weight or these are the patterns that you can adopt um, almost like pro eating disorder websites. So good news is there is a, a movement towards more like body positive messaging, which is great, but of course, just a lot of kind of vulnerability, especially for young people. Um, so the science and the research on eating disorders is really evolving, and um, I'm not sharing as many of the specific details here. There, I think, is, uh, you know, trends looking at, for example, with anorexia and the capacity for someone to substantially restrict and potentially, you know, uh, consistently or perpetually restrict that there may be some overlap with um, either other obsessive compulsive patterns. There's actually a higher comorbidity of autism spectrum in people with anorexia. Um, and we know that when you look at like functional MRI scans, someone with anorexia demonstrates a decreased reward experience to food and an increased ability to inhibit, um, sorry, that arrow was off there, to inhibit their eating than some, someone in the general population. And then someone with bulimia, with binging and purging, they tend to have some dysregulation of these drives as well. So we know that there's some changes that are happening. Um, we also recognize that there are, um, oops, I'm sorry here, it's kind of the same, um, that there are some genetic links on, fact, on uh, genes involved with neurotransmitter production also some of the sex hormones. So there's a lot of evolving research looking at, you know, what is predisposing people to develop these in terms of thinking about treatment as well. Um, but again, it's an evolving area. Okay. So we also talked about how many people with eating disorders are not ever diagnosed or really, you know, given a chance at adequate treatment. And a lot of this is related to the fact that many people with eating disorders won't bring that up or they won't come forward with it. Maybe you all can identify you're seeing someone for another reason, for depression or for um, relationship issues. And there can be a lot of content there, but you may not learn about the challenges with eating until you really ask more and are the one to bring it up. So I think we recognize historically there's been a fair amount of stigma and some degree of shame that accompanies the consideration of having an eating disorder. Um, but on the flip side, you know, the recognition that for some people it's not a problem, right? Like the capacity to be disciplined or kind of be doing something that they think will help achieve a societal goal um, may not be something they really want to change. Um, because it's a coping strategy, again, for some people, they, they might be pretty attached to it. It can be, you know, hard to think about letting go of. And then in many areas of the country, I think there's um, definitely a lack of resources, but, you know, can also be just a lack of understanding about what an eating disorder is. And, you know, for families, they may have um, a child or a family member who struggles for a long time with disordered eating, and they don't necessarily know that that's what it would be classified as. So I think, again, more kind of energy here to think about our education and awareness um, as healthcare providers, but behavioral health providers, and also with people we work with. Okay, let's see. So Jane, if you could share for me this poll question, please. Let's see. I think it's actually maybe the next one. 
Thank you. Oops. Okay. You know what, actually, Jane, maybe we missed this one, which could be my totally on me, no problem. Um, I'll just pose this question, let everybody think about it for a minute, and then we can all answer it. So what's a distinguishing feature between disordered eating and an eating disorder? Would it be someone's body mass index? Would it be their degree of impairment or impact from the eating and thought patterns? Would it be how long the symptoms are going on or their focus on body image? So the answer here is actually the, the degree of impairment and impact from the eating and thought patterns. Um, as per many things in the DSM-5, we're often talking about impairment from symptoms. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that here in this slide. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of times we see people and we get a sense that they are struggling either with their eating patterns, with their relationship with their body, Maybe they're engaging in behaviors that we would define as not very healthy, um, but where we sort of formalize that into an actual eating disorder can be thought about on a spectrum. Um, so if you consider someone who's, you know, we would see as in a good light with their relationship with their body, the way they eat, um, how they see those and, and their coping mechanisms. So, you know, we would think about the healthier side as far as pretty flexible with their eating, um, having confidence in themselves, you know, confidence in their decisions around eating. And then as the spectrum moves along, definitely seeing a shift where people might become more preoccupied with food or with dieting or with their bodies, feeling like they need to change their body, um, developing, you know, patterns of eating that are either nutritionally depriving or um, where there's excess intake and a lot of emotional connection there. Um, and then to where body image really can become more disturbed and you're seeing medical consequences or other significant psychosocial impairment. So I think it's worth keeping in mind the spectrum in part because um, you know, when people are struggling with disordered eating, even if it doesn't fall into a formal um, DSM-5 feeding and eating disorder criteria that, you know, they may be at risk certainly for developing one and can just be, I think, another conversation around kind of their coping and ways that we can help channel towards more constructive ways of coping. Comorbidities with eating disorders, very common, the norm. I mean, 90 plus percent of people with an eating disorder will have a comorbid another mental health condition. So I've listed here many of the common ones, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, very common, obsessive compulsive disorder also, especially with restrictive eating can be more common. Um, there's a high comorbidity of substance use and eating disorders. And these can kind of go two ways where you'll see that when people are um, using or abusing a substance that it might sort of divert them away from uh, their worries about food. So for example, you'll see people who are struggling with anorexia that also have an alcohol use disorder. And when they drink, it may kind of take away some of the hunger. It may, you know, keep them in a pattern that they're not as focused on eating. Um, but you can also see this with things like stimulant use disorder and the effect on appetite and eating. Um, and then as mentioned at the bottom, neurodevelopmental disorders can also be associated with eating disorders. So I share this mostly in thinking, you know, if you see somebody with an eating disorder, pretty likely they have some other symptoms going on. But if you're seeing people with other mental health conditions, I think always worth asking about, we may not have been trained to incorporate an eating disorder inventory in our assessment. So I think it's great just to develop for ourselves like a style or an approach that can help open the door into this conversation. Okay, so the formal eating disorders, feeding and eating disorders from the DSM-5, I've listed most of them here. Um, anorexia, bulimia nervosa, binge eating disorder, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, or what's called ARFID, um, and then PICA and rumination disorder, which often, especially PICA, may have some medical um, roots to it, a little bit less common. And then an other or unspecified feeding and eating disorder criteria, which I think can be great in terms of capturing symptoms that may not clearly fall into the box of one of these diagnoses, but certainly worth attending to. Okay, so we'll spend some time going through each of the criteria. I just wanted to highlight that as a spectrum, 
Um, you know, many people will have one form of disordered eating at a point in their life that will morph as they, as they get older. So for example, someone has anorexia when they're 14, 15, kind of shifts into bulimia as an older adolescent and might become binge eating disorder as they become older. So that core issue of like relationship with food body, but taking different forms. Um, so here's that question, Jane, thank you very much for the poll on uh, a key difference between anorexia and bulimia. Thank you. So I'm trying to ascertain what the, one of the main differences is. Okay. So the majority of people said the key difference is that with anorexia, you see more restricting behaviors and with bulim bulimia, you see binging and purging, which is a very common assumption. The, the answer actually though is the second one is that with anorexia, the defining feature is a low body weight ideal for their um, kind of stature or development but bulimia not being the low body weight. You can see restricting or binging and purging in both disorders actually. So we'll talk about that a little. Thanks Jane for the poll. Okay, so let's move into the formal criteria. So anorexia is defined as the restriction of energy intake that leads to a significantly low body weight. In previous versions of the DSM, this was defined by a BMI, but that is not the case at this point. So someone does not have a does not need to have a specific BMI to be diagnosed with anorexia. We still use it to define severity. The BMI still defines severity, but this gives a little bit more of a gray zone where, you know, according to behaviors, we could diagnose anorexia um, even if they're not at a certain BMI. So it's basically the restriction of energy intake, low body weight, distorted body image, and self-worth that's strongly correlated with one's appearance. There are two different subtypes, restricting, which is the most common, but then also binge purge. Um, and so often you'll see that people will binge or purge and then do a mix of restricting in between. Um, and as mentioned, we gauge severity with BMI. So 17 is mild. You know, if we're down to like the 11, 12, 13 range on BMI, that's certainly more severe. Um, common signs of anorexia, I think many people associate, you know, an individual who's very thin, who's had a lot of weight loss. Many times people will attempt to hide this. They'll wear baggy clothes, they'll avoid meals, um, and then, you know, may see a pattern of excessive exercise as well. Medically or physically, we often start seeing physiological signs of starvation. So the development of lanugo, the very fine hair that can develop with starvation, um, the changes in, you know, cardiovascular, decrease in blood pressure, decrease in heart rate, um, and then fractures also. So especially in like teenage athletes or people who are active, you may see stress fractures and other things developing. Um, just a couple of quick highlights. Again, very common to see comorbidities, especially of anxiety disorders, sometimes OCD. Um, medical consequences or sequelae are often related to the malnutrition that develops. Um, and we talked earlier about how it has the highest mortality rate of any mental health condition um, with a fair amount of people who die being by suicide, not just due to like medical complications. And for anorexia, especially, this is where we really think about early intervention being key in terms of preventing ongoing or refractory um, situation. Okay, so avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. This is a newer diagnosis to the DSM-5 and was really intended to capture individuals who are struggling with their nutritional intake and having some um, effects from the nutritional deprivation or weight issues. But the difference here and where this is not anorexia is that while they have low nutritional intake, often resulting in poor weight gain or weight loss or nutritional deficiency, they're not as connected with body image, the distorted body image and the drive to change their body. So many people with ARFID will recognize that they're thin. They may want to gain weight. They may want to be bigger, but they're really struggling with the process of eating um, 
And so this tends to be common in younger children, for example, with neurodevelopmental disorders like autism spectrum, with other um, developmental disabilities, and then also with people with anxiety disorders or OCD. And you can see that, you know, someone may not have a history of any disordered eating, and then they either have a traumatic event happen as they're older, or they develop a GI illness, and all of a sudden really start restricting their food, and that can spiral into a pattern that leads to some nutritional deficiencies and fits this category. So the treatment for avoidant restrictive food intake disorder can parallel um, anorexia, but also be a little different. We'll talk about that later. Um, okay, so another question here then as we move into the next group. So the definition of a binge, which is important to think about for bulimia and binge eating disorder. Thanks, Jane. Okay, awesome. So the majority of people got this correct. So the definition of a binge is eating in a discrete time, a significantly larger amount than most others would eat in that similar situation with subsequent or accompanied feelings of guilt and shame. So it's not as much how many calories, uh, exactly how much somebody's eating, but more the experience of eating quite a bit of food and having the sense of feeling out of control or guilt and shame that comes with that. So bulimia nervosa um, is defined by the experience of someone who is binging and then compensating. So we often call it binging and purging or binging and, and attempting to compensate for that at least once a week for more than three months. Many people with bulim bulimia will binge and purge daily or multiple times a day. Um, again, as with anorexia, there's usually a strong connection of self-worth with body image. And um, here you see people at more of, for their body, a normal or elevated weight. Um, the pictures, I included a male here just because there are quite a few males who struggle with bulimia. Sometimes it gets sort of wrapped into what people might call like a gym culture or, you know, fitness um, kind of like muscle, you know, body related phenomenon. Um, but again, not uncommon to see. So in terms of how people purge, most common is self-induced vomiting, but there's still quite a few people that will use laxatives, smaller percentage that will use things like diet pills, diuretics, or even thyroid hormones, um, other ways to try to manipulate their metabolism. And so, um, you know, I think people will identify with bulimia. There's some physical signs you can see, for example, the kind of scarring on the back of the knuckles, Russell's sign, which can happen if someone's inducing vomiting and hitting their knuckles on their teeth. Um, the gentleman in the bottom right has uh, sialid, uh, sialidinosis. <laughs> Sorry, I always get caught on that one. So that's basically the kind of inflammation and swelling of the parotid glands in the cheeks, which can happen with excess vomiting. Um, and then dental issues. Again, these are mostly with vomiting, but you can certainly see other kind of medical consequences related to purging. Um, and again, sometimes weight fluctuations, certainly some of the other psychological features as noted here. So issues with mood, um, sometimes impulsivity and self-harm behaviors that are more common to see in bulimia. And then as mentioned, we'll talk about some of the medical um, Com complications. Bulimia is more commonly kind of spread amongst people of uh, various racial and ethnic backgrounds. And just an aside that some people will develop a bit of an addiction, what feels like an addiction to them um, with purging, where it sort of loses the connection that they're trying to get rid of what they ate, but more that the feeling they get from purging, which, you know, vomiting really, we release endorphins when that happens. Um, but they get a bit of a high or a bit of a feeling of release, similar to cutting for some people. Um, and that that itself can be a separate kind of issue to treat. Diabulimia, just a word here, is not in the DSM-5, but this is in people with insulin-dependent diabetes who intentionally misuse their insulin in an attempt to not gain weight. So generally where they're not administering insulin in a hope that they won't absorb glucose the same way. And this can definitely have concerning medical effects on blood sugar regulation. I think some statistics I've seen are that up to 10% of 
people with diabetes will actually have some form of disordered eating, um, which goes along with, you know, the, the rigidity and some of the stress that comes with diabetes in terms of monitoring intake and, and weight and food. Okay, so then binge eating disorder, which again is a new diagnosis of the DSM-5, is defined as the binging, so at least once a week for more than three, three months, with again those negative feelings that come with binging, feeling of guilt, remorse, lack of control over eating, but there's not the compensatory measures that go along with bulimia, and so often you see some metabolic um, complications or weight-related, like higher weight for people with binge eating, but definitely that's not... Uh, that's not the only situation. Um, behaviors, you know, people may kind of isolate around eating or um, engage in binging behaviors on their own, in part because of the shame that comes with it. Um, it's often not uncommon to see people who have binge eating disorder that are referred to weight loss clinics or gastric bypass surgery or other surgical interventions. And maybe haven't had a full assessment of some of the behaviors that are driving their weight issues. Um, common with binge eating to see often mood disorders, sometimes a history of trauma and ADHD is a little bit more common diagnosis here in terms of impulsivity, especially. Um, and binge eating disorder is more common in people of color when you look at some of the statistics that we have thus far. And then I mentioned the unspecified category. So again, this would just be, you know, thinking about how we conceptualize when someone's struggling with disordered eating, but not so clearly into one of the criteria that we discussed, but that we want to keep track of it. Um, in terms of differential, you know, I really think like when the question comes up of, is this person struggling with eating because it's, you know, really secondary to an anxiety disorder or that they have severe major depression and they've just lost their appetite and aren't eating as well. I think it's worth attuning to that core connection of someone's relationship with their body, their kind of intentional drives with food um, and how food or, you know, body related concerns come into play in terms of coping. Um, these are usually pretty primary with an eating disorder and tend to be more secondary um, or that, you know, primarily appetite or the ability to eat is affected if, it's another diagnosis that's primary instead. Okay, so let's talk about some assessment strategies. I think this one can be tricky where, you know, people are, where we try to determine how is best to open up this conversation. Um, so in terms of assessment, I think it's worth just, you know, us keeping an open mind towards cues for an eating disorder, some of which we've talked about. Um, and also just being mindful about assumptions we may have, kind of the language we use when we're talking about it, um, and thinking about how we can both educate while we're asking about it, or, you know, if we're picking up on some eating disordered symptoms, um, and in connecting with family, loved ones, you know, ways that we can be of support for someone who's struggling. Um, when we wear medical hats in terms of working with people with eating disorders, you know, we want to think about how someone is doing in terms of their basic vitals, um, their weight and changes in weight, and any laboratory um, or kind of other primary symptoms that we want to focus on. Having a medical, a primary medical professional who's involved in taking care of someone with an eating disorder can be very valuable just to be able to track these things and to make sure that, um, you know, something else that maybe worsening the symptoms is also not being missed. Okay. Um, so again, in our assessment strategy, you know, I've, some people like to take more of a general approach, which can be like, tell me a bit about your relationship with food. Tell me about your relationship with your body. Um, you know, kind of a very general approach to it. I know some people prefer to have more targeted questions objectively. And so I think asking about things like behaviors, you know, do you restrict, do you purge, do you binge, getting a sense about frequency, what that looks like for people, um, connection with other symptoms, you know, so do they tend to restrict more when they're feeling more anxious, for example, um, how does someone see their body or their self-esteem and then the system, both the family, the other people around them, um, 
you know, getting a sense of how their eating disorder plays a role in terms of their connection with other people can be helpful. And then physical symptoms as well, right? So is someone feeling lightheaded a lot? Do they have palpitations? Just kind of running through a, a medical review of symptoms can be helpful. So this, I, yeah, this is what I was mentioning. I, I think just having some questions that open the door um, or maybe asking, for example, for kids or teenagers, you know, they may, <laughs> they may not um, have the most in-depth answer to, to some of these abstract questions. And so I think also just asking sort of concrete, like, can you tell me what you ate yesterday? Can you tell me how much you've exercised this week? Um, can also be reflective. So as we gauge more history of what it, their eating disorder patterns are, we also want to attend to the um, you know, comorbid symptoms and concerns that we may have. So I think getting a sense of what someone's insight is to their disordered eating patterns, um, how motivated they are to change, you know, is this an issue to them and they really want to get help or, or not quite there? Um, what's their support like? Getting a sense of their kind of individual family and cultural beliefs about food. And then definitely thinking about safety and stability. Um, and I'll come back to that, but, uh, you know, just thinking about psychiatric and medical stability. Um, so I think often it'll come up where we're concerned or we believe someone's struggling with disordered eating, but they may, you know, not, they may deny it if we ask about it. Um, they may minimize it. And then there can be a question of how much do we really push, right? And at what point is it appropriate for us to start talking to other people, for example, family members where, when we're concerned about an individual who's not really um, disclosing or uh, at the same level of insight about it. So again, I think this can be a gray zone, but this is where we wanna think about, you know, someone's overall stability and safety, um, including medically in, in terms of where we start perhaps becoming a little bit more assertive on, when someone really needs to be engaging with help. So we know that people with eating disorders are at a higher risk of suicide um, and that many will also struggle with self-harm. People with restrictive eating may also struggle with, uh, you know, may get to the point that we would consider grave passive neglect. And so there are these arms to be thinking about for sure. And then medically, um, you can see some pretty profound medical consequences of eating disorders. I'll run through those here quickly. Um, but, you know, when we're seeing safety considerations, again, I think that's where we, we start transitioning from kind of the pre-contemplative conversations or just, you know, engaging in assessment into really pushing into getting people a higher level of care or more support. So let's talk about some of the medical sequelae. I'll move through this quickly. Um, eating disorders, because they affect nutrition and our bodies rely on that from head to toe, can affect all parts of our body. Um, so I wanted to highlight some key systems here. Our cardiovascular system um, definitely can be affected in anorexia with the weight loss that happens throughout the body. You also see some loss of muscle in the heart itself. This can lead to things like mitral valve prolapse because of the way the heart shape changes when muscle is lost. You can also see the changes kind of developing orthostatic blood pressure um, and just the decrease in heart rate and blood pressure with starvation. Um, in bulimia, especially if there is frequent purging that's affecting electrolytes, people run the risk of developing arrhythmias um, and binge eating. We tend to see more like the metabolic sequelae that happen with elevated weight or significant caloric intake. In terms of the metabolic and electrolyte systems with both anorexia and bulimia, you can definitely see significant derangements here. With anorexia, you often see low total body stores of most electrolytes, right? So they're just not eating adequately in general. And so phosphorus, potassium, sodium, those can all drop. Um, sometimes this doesn't happen until someone's quite ill or quite low body weight, but worth checking. And then bulimia, especially with vomiting or laxative use, you can see um, loss of potassium, acid base shifts, um, and then in terms of GI symptoms, gastrointestinal. So many people with eating disorders tend to have a sensitivity towards their gastrointestinal system at baseline. And so some may be that somatically they're more uh, kind of attuned to or 
connected with what's happening in their gut, but you can also see, you know, kind of consequences from the change in eating patterns. So with anorexia, where people are just not eating adequately, their GI system tends to slow down. So they can develop symptoms that result from slowed motility, um, abdominal discomfort, sometimes pain when they start eating again, um, constipation, and just not absorbing things well. And then with bulimia, because of purging, you can see definitely some issues from, um, the, the acid, you know, if acid is coming up in terms of irritation or heartburn, um, other lower GI symptoms. And then with binging, you know, again, you can frequently see some stomach related, um, reflux or heartburn related symptoms. Uh, so then one other section I wanted to make sure to touch on with, um, medical is how disordered eating affects our endocrine hormone systems, including our bone development. And this one I think can be a good anchor. I work with a lot of adolescents with eating disorders and they may not be quite as, you know, it may not quite land as much to them. If we talk about long-term um, risk of medical consequences, except when we start talking about, you know, how it can affect their hair, their skin, their teeth, and their bones. So when someone loses substantial weight or is really restricting, with even just six months of that, um, for a, a female who started menarche, they can have substantial bone loss, which frequently develops into osteopenia, sometimes osteoporosis. And so this can affect young people and it's really hard to reverse. It's hard for them to rebuild bone after they've lost it. So I think this can be a big motivation medically in terms of trying to get people help or to you know, kind of get their families on board too. Um, with other eating disorders, you can definitely see additional hormone disruptions. Um, and there's research going on to look at like chicken or the egg, you know, is this related to kind of blood sugar metabolism and, and intake, or are there other pieces that are involved in the overlap that we see here? Okay. That was a very quick, uh, kind of tour de force of medical symptoms, but just to highlight, Again, I think where we want to, you know, have some seriousness when we approach the care for someone with an eating disorder, um, psychologically, but also medically. Okay, so now we're going to jump into the last part, which is talking about treatment. Um, so really a multidisciplinary approach for people with eating disorders is best, especially when it's available. So having a good medical core, um, just to track how someone is doing physiologically is really crucial. The foundational pieces of therapy and nutrition rehabilitation are very important. Psychiatrically, there's a lot of space in terms of evaluation um, and some support with medications. And then again, thinking about how we, you know, how we take care of people within their family systems or just the support networks around them. Um, I touched on this, I think, from a medical stance, often having routine visits with someone so that vital signs, weight, symptoms can be tracked, can be very helpful. And this will determine to some extent how severe, this will be determined, I should say, by how severe someone's symptoms are. There are published criteria for when someone should be medically hospitalized for an eating disorder. Much of this falls within the bulimia anorexia or ARFID categories, and it's usually relevant to cardiac um, experiences or a significantly low body weight or electrolyte issues, in part because of um, the risk of sudden death that can happen with some of those, and also with the risk of refeeding syndrome or other more severe kind of secondary complications. Okay. So therapy is a, is a foundational tenet in working with people with eating disorders. The, the strongest evidence base for kind of the modality of therapy is cognitive behavioral therapy kind of across the board. Um, for adolescents with anorexia, something called Maudsley or a family-based therapy approach also has a lot of evidence. Um, and then dialectical behavioral therapy can be very helpful when we think about emotional regulation, distress tolerance, kind of the intersection there with where people might rely on or turn to food or exercise as coping 
There are many additional modalities though that we know can be helpful. Some of these just haven't been studied quite in quite the same way, but things like body-centered or more somatic therapies, acceptance and commitment, um, trauma-focused, there's, there's quite a range here. So I think it's really key that we make sure that people have a connection with therapy and then also nutrition or dietitian support. Um, so where this is particularly important is that often when someone's developed an eating disorder, their connection with what's normal, like what they should be eating for themselves and their hunger and just kind of attunement with cues for hunger and when they should eat become pretty distorted and people may just lose entire touch with that. And so working with an informed dietitian can be really helpful in giving people a sense of what's realistic, what they need, if they're trying to change their weight, what's appropriate, and then really getting an additional level of counseling and coaching on how to make those changes. Um, dietitians, you know, there's a mix of approaches between pretty regimented exchanges or like, you know, really trying to have a more rigid structure versus more intuitive eating. Um, and this can depend a lot on what works best for a person and probably also, you know, which eating disorder specifically we're talking about. Okay, so from the psychiatrist um, level, if we're thinking about how can we help people in terms of medications. So there are not medications specifically for an eating disorder. Really what we're looking at is how can we help someone in terms of symptoms that they're having to reduce maybe some of the stress around eating, to improve their capacity to regulate their eating um, and help with comorbid symptoms like anxiety, mood, et cetera. So the piece I wanted to highlight here was that um, nutrition has a really big influence on mood. And I think you know from an integrative perspective, we're certainly developing better awareness about that within mental health. But when you see people who are really restricting that can definitely lead to nutritional depression, restriction, and when people are not getting in enough amino acids, especially tryptophan, um, can have downstream effects on their serotonin production and melatonin production. Tryptophan's the precursor for those. Um, and so there are definite nutritional effects on mood. Also, you know, with binging and purging or with binging, certainly some people will experience some kind of cognitive experiences when they have a substantial intake of food um, and shift in their glucose levels as well. Okay, so medications for some of the specific disorders for restrictive eating, anorexia and ARFID, there's not evidence that the SSRIs, the kind of standard antidepressants have much benefit in mood or weight. And some of this is based on what I was mentioning that many people who are restricting, it's hard for them to make adequate serotonin if their nutritional intake is low. So more of the trend in the field is looking at um, treating anxiety. So anti-anxiolytics, whether that's standing or as needed, and then low dose atypical antipsychotics, olanzapine, aripiprazole, for example, that can actually help with decreasing anxiety, decreasing some of the obsessional thoughts that people develop with eating, especially the more restrictive they get, and to some extent helping improve weight. We don't usually see huge weight changes from low dose atypicals in people in this population, but um, it can just help people stabilize as they're improving their nutrition. Um, bupropion has a black box warning for eating disorders. It increases the risk of seizure. So we really want to try to avoid that in people with active anorexia or bulimia. Um, with bulimia, fluoxetine has, at higher doses, has good evidence for decreasing urges to binge and purge. And this probably applies to other serotonergic antidepressants. Um, naltrexone has some reasonable evidence in terms of the kind of like positive feeling and kind of high that people will describe that they get from purging um, or from binging. Naltrexone can actually help reduce that and sometimes help reduce the drive to binge or purge. Um, and then again, I think we can sometimes look at other medication targets that might help with impulsivity and mood reactivity. 
Um, similar to bulimia for binge eating disorders, the antidepressants like fluoxetine can reduce binge episodes. And then stimulants, so Lystex-amphetamine, which is Vyvanse, is FDA approved for, um, for binge eating disorder. And we think that, you know, one, the stimulants reduce, to some extent will reduce appetite in many people, but by targeting some of the similar pathways as with ADHD, especially involving impulsivity, it seems to help reduce the drive for people to turn to binging um, as, a, as a solution to dysregulated emotions. Okay, um, so we've talked about a lot of different kinds of treatment. As with other forms of mental health care, there is kind of a pyramid of levels of care. So many people with disordered eating can make great progress at a standard kind of outpatient level of care. But as one's disordered eating becomes more rigid or more severe, or they have other um, comorbidities, thinking about higher levels of care can be very helpful. So intensive outpatient, partial hospitalization or day treatment, and then residential and inpatient, um, all can be important options for people who are struggling to make change at lower levels of care or potentially continuing to decompensate. Um, so when we decide to move someone to a higher level of care can depend on things like, you know, again, are they struggling to make change at lower levels of care? Um, have they developed some medical complications secondary to their disordered eating? Are there safety risks? Is there ongoing suicidal ideation? Um, you know, are there other psychiatric comorbidities, substance use, where this person is really struggling to make change? Um, and so those can all be involved in some of the decision making. Um, let's see. So we've talked a lot about disordered eating and symptoms to look for, considerations to take into account with assessment and treatment. I just wanted to take a minute to honor that I think many of us would agree it can be very rewarding to work with people who are struggling with disordered eating, especially as we see shifts and change. But it can also be difficult, especially for working with someone who has pretty limited insight or is not really able to open up about their symptoms or is pre-contemplative and doesn't wanna change. You know, Those can be tricky relationships to navigate. Um, and so I think there are, you know, thankfully some great kind of collaborative resources available out there um, in terms of brainstorming around, you know, how do I really help this individual specifically? What are some good strategies for me to increase into my practice and resources to know about? Um, including access to different services. So I just wanted to share that in terms of youth, and we realize many adolescents are, you know, this is a peak age of incidence of eating disorders, um, that there are also a lot of great web and online social media resources for them. Um, so I just wanted to highlight those here. Again, these slides will be available, but there are some apps like phone apps that specifically for eating disorder recovery that I think can be great if someone isn't able to get into or kind of receive the degree of therapeutic support that we'd like to see. Um, but that, you know, I think sometimes people also engage very well when they have something on their phone to be accountable towards. Um, there's also some really cool apps for body positivity. And I think this can be great when we think about the societal pressures and um, you know, where we look at in terms of people feeling negatively about themselves. Um, there are more programs nationally attempting to do some school-based education and intervention for young people with eating disorders, which again, thinking from a preventative level and trying to get kids to be supportive of one another, I think can potentially go a long way. Um, and then these are just a few kind of pearls that I think about a lot and, and take away from today's session. Um, so early intervention is really important, especially for restrictive eating, but in general. So the more that we can develop ways to assess and to like have on our radar if someone is struggling with this, um, you know, even if we're not able to provide them with a specific targeted eating disorder kind of treatment protocol, just having the conversation, having them involved in some therapeutic support, nutritional support can really go a long way. 
Um, many people with disordered eating will make changes in their eating, but continue to struggle with body image for a long time. And so I do think that's a more complex, you know, kind of consideration and topic. Um, and yeah, just something that clinically, I think we see a lot. Pretty common to see trauma history. Um, and so working on the trauma in addition to the eating disorder can be pretty important. The other thing I've seen helpful is that, you know, sometimes we come into situations and we, you know, identify it as an issue and we want to see big change. I think with disordered eating, considering kind of a harm reduction intervention can also be beneficial, right? So for example, someone with bulimia who's frequently binging and purging, our goal for them might be to get to the point that they're not binging and purging, but that can feel like a really long way for them. And so smaller steps like, okay, what are some things to reduce their desire to purge after they've eaten? If they brush their teeth, will that help? If they take a five minute walk, will that help? You know, kind of intervening with smaller um, steps that they can perhaps have more success with, I think can go a long way into breaking some of these patterns that chronically have become coping for them. And then again, I think collaboration, multidisciplinary collaboration as available is very important and pretty crucial to treatment. Um, I'll come back to questions. I have just resources. There are some great websites. So NIDA, the National Eating Disorder Association has a really nice website. I think this is great for families, individuals. Um, for professionals, there are a couple associations just to recommend the Academy of Eating Disorders. Definitely has um, kind of an academic bent to it. There are some great support groups here for clinicians as well. And then the International Academy of Eating Disorder Professionals. Um, all of these have some nice trainings and webinars available as well. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate your time. I'm happy to be available for future questions or contact. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you all today. Thank you, Dr. Sauer. That was like a tour de force. That was pretty, pretty remarkable. Thank you. Um, so uh, folks out there, uh, please uh, put in uh, qu any questions you have in the Q&A button. And uh, I, I'll uh, start us off here. Um, Christina, I was wondering, you know, when you talk about high school athletes, um, um, work that's done or required or like with high school and college coaches um, around, around this, sometimes um, I've, I've seen it, heard it, of it, like not related to body image as much as say I can run faster or I can be a better diver. Um, have you run into that and do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. It's a great question. And I think very pertinent in terms of athletics and sports for, um, for teenagers, college and beyond. So, you know, I, my understanding is there's not a lot of formal expectation in terms of like training or requirements. I definitely think there's a trend towards um, embracing and, you know, people just being aware of this in athletics, definitely. Um, there is more and more about like the female athlete triad and, you know, the, the concerns about um, kind of medical consequences for athletes when they're undernourished, especially given their levels of performance. So I think um, a couple of things that I've heard of or seen too are, you know, I think when there's opportunities to engage with coaches or just other influential people for athletes um, to have open conversations. And sometimes if a coach themselves has struggled to be open about that with their athletes, that that can also go a long way. You know, um, I know for some teams, there's a question of like, at what point do we decide that this person really can't continue, you know, if they're eating or um, overall health is becoming, if it's potentially becoming uh, dangerous or a risk for them, at what point we can say, look, we need you to take, take a leave or not be participating. Um, so yeah, I think in general, there's a great evolution in the, you know, in this field, but to my understanding, not so much that's formally kind of expected or required in terms of training for coaches. Right. Which gets complicated when the team is doing well based on right. um, 
Exactly. Yes. The yeah. performance of the athletes and sometimes the coaches don't want to step in. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so we have, wow, I suddenly look and now there's 10 questions that have just emerged. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to try an, a new thing and uh, so that we can all see the question. Um, uh, Meg Weissman says, I, asks, I apologize if I missed this, but can you expand on the use of BMI to assess severity for individuals who are considered overweight or obese and may be severely restricting, but that may not be seen with BMI? Great question. Yeah, so BMI has, I think still in the, in the medical community, especially a lot of anchoring in terms of how we see um, someone's weight in terms of being healthy or not. I would say within the kind of eating disorder realm, there's another movement that maybe some people have heard of, of called health at any size, which is um, embracing the concept that, you know, people can be healthy at a variety of sizes and not necessarily purely defined by BMI. Um, I would say for the specific eating disorders that you mentioned, so anorexia and binge eating disorder, that it tends to be when we're in the in the scope of extremes, you know, so either very low for anorexia or very high for binge eating, um, that the medical concerns, the complications that happen at those levels, I think become very uh, meaningful in terms of how much we need to really advocate for and support someone getting help. Um, but yeah, for both disorders at this case, or at this time, I'm sorry, the BMI is really just something that we will used to reflect how severe the eating disorder is, um, but not to define the disorder itself. All right, I'm gonna um, post, uh, Kenneth Burr has, has put in uh, two cases that uh, he, he's worked with, one in which dental um, problems abscess um, led to a, a brain abscess, um, and, and another in, in which there was kind of questions about who um, who's treating um, a young an anorectic patient um, leading to the patient becoming unconscious and dying um, mm. because of questions of um, where they should be treated. And I, I guess that speaks to the severity um, of this population that sometimes um, I, I think we, we underestimate a little bit. And so I was wondering if, Christina, if you had thoughts about that. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm really, that's very sad, really, um, really disheartening to hear about those those individuals, it's, yeah, I think, um, I think that does speak to the severity, both psychologically and medically that can happen for people in these situations. The other piece is that, you know, many people with eating disorders will not see a psychiatrist or a mental health professional, right? Like they'll kind of fly under the radar. Um, there's been studies looking at emergency room presentations, people coming in who have an eating disorder, a vast majority of them, like that isn't really assessed or necessarily, um, seen as a primary contributor during a lot of the visits. So yeah, I think it's it, it highlights too um, in terms of that connection between primary care and other interface points for individuals who might be struggling with an eating disorder, um, how we can support and leverage care when they really need it. So for example, someone with anorexia who's losing a lot of weight or lost a lot of weight and at risk of severe complications, you know, like kind of where we can anchor in that we really need to get them more help mm -hmm. and need more support. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Tammy Amiri asks, uh, says that once I'd mentioned not using 30 milligrams of Vyvanse for bulimia and says we were taught 30 milligrams twice daily. Are you saying 70 milligrams and 50 milligrams is better and will insurance improve this dosage? That's a really good question. <clears throat> so my understanding from the data is that it's like a, on the upper end of total daily dose. So the 50 or 70 being the single doses, but I would think the 30 twice a day would be fairly equivalent in terms of the, the benefit that's seen in reducing um, urges to binge. I personally have struggled with Vyvanse in terms of insurance coverage in general and, and sometimes BID, but um, yeah, I think more of the specific studies were looking at the once a day 50 and 70, but I tend to think if you're in that higher end range that it's likely to be therapeutic. And 
Allison Barker Ford uh, types in uh, that there's such a shortage of eating disorder therapists or those who have specialized treatment in this area. Do you have any tips or resources for families who are looking for therapists that specialize in eating disorders? And I, I know you shared some of those um, website resources too. Yeah, I, I I think every day I find this to be a challenge as well. And, and I know nationally it's um, it's a challenge. You know, I think, so I have a couple thoughts on that. One is that for many people with disordered eating, um, you know, I think the general, having a good general therapist who can work on emotional regulation and coping um, and, and really thinking about, you know, some of the drivers for an eating disorder and where they can develop, you know, like a um, sort of stronger coping or just better insight into that, I think can go a long way. Um, that's where I think also having a dietitian involved, if possible, the dietitian, dietitians can do a great work of coaching and counseling around eating and behaviors specifically where, um, you know, I think they can be complementary and in ways kind of create, uh, create a little bit of a bridge if you don't have a therapist readily available. Um, but yeah, I have been also looking beyond some of the websites, there are several sites and I could include this that have free support groups online virtually. And, you know, they're led by experienced clinicians, but I think that can also be a nice resource um, that's a little bit more accessible, especially to more people. Hey, so you made me think, um, putting on your training director hat, is in the national organizations, is there talk of like an eating disorder fellowship or are there places that offer like a non-ACGME accredited eating disorder fellowship? That's a really good question. Um, I think there are some, some of the residential treatment facilities I know will host trainees like residents or fellows out of psychiatry or other medical specialties. Mm -hmm. The only actual fellowship I know of is at so Denver Health Hospital has a 50 plus bed ICU for people with eating disorders and it's called acute, which is very fitting for the acuity. They just started a one year fellowship, which oh. I think is actually for like internal medicine or family medicine maybe. Um, but that's targeted really just on subspecialized care for people with eating disorders. Hopefully this will be an area that evolves. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, Melissa Malone says, can you speak to the idea of secondary gain and risk of parents focusing too closely on adolescents with restrictive eating or anorexia? That is a great, that's a great question. Um, yeah. And you can see sort of the, the two ends of the spectrum, right? Sometimes you see parents who sort of are dismissive and they don't pay too much attention versus where it becomes a sole point of focus. Um, so I do think in, you know, in, in those realms, something like the Maudsley family therapy approach, but it can be more generalized than that, um, where there's this education for families around kind of like how they can, you know, at some point have the degree of monitoring and control and making sure that their teenager is doing okay but how that transition happens where they start transitioning like control and more autonomy to their teenager, I think can be really valuable. And so, um, you know, there's a fair amount of parent education available um, through some of these websites or through some of the places that teach Maudsley. Um, but again, it's probably also a little bit more family systems, right? Like is focusing on their eating, allowing them to avoid focusing on something else. And so I do think some good family work that's not just about the kids eating can be really valuable there too. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Richard Francis asks, what about preteens on ADHD meds who restrict and have growth problems or any strategies for treatment? Yes. Yeah. Great question again. So um, I would say in this category, like we want to think about <clears throat> First of all, the benefit risk of the medication, right? If the medication benefit is such that we would like to continue it, then I think it's really a strategy around if we're going to continue the medication, then we need to see some like kind of 
you know, buy in from the teenager or the family or everyone to make sure that nutritionally they're meeting what they need. So if that means that they need to have a good breakfast before they take their medication, or they need to really do some catch up eating at the end of the day. Um, I think often like coming down to the, the bottom line of what they're getting in and that nutritionally they're meeting what they need is pretty important. I, I definitely see, right. There's, there are many people who develop eating disorders who have ADHD or on stimulants or other medications that can suppress appetite. And I think, you know, the conversation around like, we, you know, we want to continue what helps you and what you want to continue or what you feel like is, is beneficial, but only if we can do that in a safe way. Right. So if you're continuing to restrict, if you're continuing to lose weight, like this may be a plan we need to change and maybe we need to go to a different medication or a different strategy. Another um, attendee asks, um, says, thanks for a very informative session and is wondering about the criteria of low body weight. Um, and um, believes we're seeing more anorexia restrictive type behaviors in individuals who are not low body weight and wonders if this then impacts the ability to diagnose someone with anorexia versus not otherwise specified, unspecified eating disorder and how that then impacts treatment. It says, I sort of feel like this criteria is further perpetuating the idea of thinness as something to strive for, even if only for the purpose of getting the correct diagnosis or treatment. Yeah, interesting, really good point. So in it's not a formal terminology, but people often use the verbiage atypical anorexia when you have someone who's a higher body weight, but really engaging in anorexia kind of behaviors and patterns. Um, I mean, I think, you know, with what's being seen in the research, really people who are significantly restricting um, develop nutritional deficiencies and have weight loss, even if they're not getting to a low BMI, you can really see some of the patterns that happen um, in terms of like more distorted thinking, you know, a perpetuation of the, the restrictive eating um, it can look, you know, anorexia can look very similar in someone with a, a low BMI as it can with sort of a, a little higher BMI. Um, and so, you know, my, my thoughts on the question are that um, there's within the field, there's a push to kind of expand the definition of anorexia to be a little bit less about actual body weight, a little more about the behaviors and things like weight loss that are happening um, and honoring that in both situations, you can see a risk of medical complications. You can see kind of similar psychological outcomes from it. Um, yeah, so it just seems to be something about for people, you know, with a risk of genetic risk or what it might be, if they get into a pattern of losing weight and restricting that it can really spiral. Um, but again, that can happen at a variety of BMIs and weights. So too many questions to get to. Um, last one here. Um, do you have any thoughts about supporting and honoring people when it's clear that it will be terminal uh, for the patient? Yeah, that's a very difficult question. I think there's some great there there are some great publications in terms of the ethics of working with people with eating disorders. Um, and at what point we kind of as providers shift our perspective to like, you know, maybe this isn't something that we're going to go in and fix and change into a different trajectory. Um, so, yeah, and then there's the gray zone of given what we know about how malnutrition affects cognition and insight, you know, at what point do we uh, do we decide that someone who is low body weight and chronically restricting is in a state of mind to have capacity to make that decision that, you know, that they don't want to change, they don't want to get better. And so they're probably going to continue in this refractory pattern versus where we think, you know, we need to go in and restore their nutrition and give their brain a chance to work differently, to think differently. Um, so basically I think it's a very complex question taking into account all of those points, but definitely one that, you know, at some point the acceptance of patterns people are choosing is important for us to honor for sure. All right. There are more questions, but we are at time. Thank you, Dr. Sauer, for your informative, inspiring tour de force presentation. Thank you to all of us, um, all of you for joining us. And as I said earlier, for those wishing to receive CME and CEC credits,
please complete the evaluation survey that will automatically pop up in the browser as the webinar and thank you, Dr. Sauer, so much for uh, for joining us today. Um, thank you for your offer of um, being available to answer questions. Is that all right if um, people send you an email or? Sure. Okay. And and um, yeah, thank you to everyone for joining us. This is the moment in which we're all sent uh, away into our isolated spaces and return to work after an hour and a half of connecting together. So, so with that caveat. Um, Thank you everyone for being here and see you in a couple of weeks. And thanks again, Christina. Thank you so much.